When you think of the military, you probably think of guns and explosions. But of course, there's more to them than that. Like war and conflict, extreme weather events pose a serious threat to millions of people around the world. In 2019 alone, these threats uprooted about 33.4 million people from their homes, many living in developing countries. Extreme weather events triggered 24.9 million of those, three times the number of people affected by war and conflict during that same year. And scientists everywhere are saying similar things, that as the world gets hotter and the global population booms, extreme weather disasters will become more frequent and will only get worse, causing a worldwide humanitarian catastrophe. This bloke is Wallace Broker, otherwise known as the grandfather of climate science. He coined the term global warming in a paper he wrote back in 1975, but back then, his warnings were largely ignored. It's only recently that we're seeing global leaders begin to take the threat of global warming, more commonly referred to as climate change, seriously. Climate change, climate change, climate change, climate change, climate change. And the calls for their militaries to provide humanitarian aid to those affected by disaster grow louder. So, with all this set to happen in the coming years, I wonder what this could look like. My name's Ben Cook. I'm an ex-Royal Marine turned journalist, and this is what I want to find out. People often think that disasters happen to someone somewhere else. But recent extreme weather incidents like the floods here in Western Germany show that this isn't exactly the case. Back in July 2021, record rainfall caused some of the worst floods the region had experienced in decades. I'm in a town called Blessem. Photographs of its quarry could be seen all over the internet back in July. Despite having flood defences, the quarry could not withstand the impact from the water. Homes, which once stood behind me, were either damaged, destroyed, or swept away. When the R River burst its banks back in July, many places in the Arvila district were severely affected. Thousands lost their homes and over 130 people died. And even now, over half a year on, the consequences of the flood can still be seen everywhere. We've just arrived in a town called Arvila. This was another town that were badly hit by the floods back in July. We've been in touch with a lady called Karen. She's kindly agreed to chat to us about her experiences. Oh. Hello, Karen. How are you? Not too bad. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much. Inside. Thank you. So this was all underwater. Yes. One meter 80, one meter 70 high, something like that. Yeah. If you look at the windows, you can still see the mark. So I went to the entrance door, and in the moment when I took the handle, I could see water coming inside the house. And I was like, who? Opened the door, and this moment the water was coming. It was like a big wave hitting me, and I was like, whoa! The water came from everywhere. It came through the gaps in the, in the door. It came through the cellar. It came through the French windows in the living room and it was rising, the world has changed. The world as I know it was completely gone. Help came from thousands of people, from the civilian population, public services, and the military. I'm at a German military base in Minden to speak to some of the soldiers who were there. The German military was deployed with uh, quite, quite a large number of, of soldiers. Since the military has such a high responsiveness, there, there's always the, the possibility to send military as a first responder. When it comes to disaster response, military involvement isn't exactly new. A disaster happens when a hazardous event, like a flood or an earthquake, interacts with the vulnerability and capacity of a group of people to cope, causing human, material and economic impacts. They can also be man-made disasters like oil spills or conflict. The reality is that most disasters occur in developing countries. This is because poor disaster prevention methods like flood defences are expensive and basic needs like food, water and shelter are a priority. Urban areas are also crowded and poorly built, enhancing the consequences when a hazardous event becomes a disaster. 
military disaster response operations can be tracked back to Alexander the Great. Since then, militaries everywhere have helped alleviate the suffering of millions amid crisis. When we reached the Ar Valley, we had still a situation that people needed help um, and, and helicopters um, provided them with food, with, with water, with everything and um, there was an urgent need for help. And uh, when we came there and provided bridges, we opened these roads and, and gave access to civilian authorities. People were really thankful. There was no issue or, or any problem with the military. But big changes came much more recently. This piece of concrete was once a part of the 96 mile long Berlin Wall. It separated Western and Soviet occupation zones dividing capitalism and communism. It fell in 1989, symbolising the end of the Cold War. It was this time the UK redirected money and resources away from national security and towards operations other than war, including drug countermeasures, peace building and disaster response operations. Another major change came some years later, in 1998, when a government defence review announced that additional tasks would be assigned to the UK armed forces to keep up with the evolving defence environment and the new government focus. Around 30 years on, today we are experiencing an acceleration in climate breakdown, causing more extreme weather-related disasters like storms and floods. So with this change, some people think that this should become a core role for modern militaries everywhere. Disasters usually overwhelm local communities and their emergency services, and given the sudden and devastating nature, require a large, coordinated reaction. You've heard of institutions like the Red Cross, but there are also smaller, often local organisations who work closer to the centre of a disaster, providing specific things like food, water, shelter or education. The water was nearly until, until the ceiling from the first floor. And so nearly every house had this water this high. You could see it at this house too. After a few weeks, you were, um, there were a lot of organizations um, helping here. Everybody on his own way. And it was amazing to watch um, people coming from all over Germany sometimes. Um, uh, from far away to, to help each other. So, what is it that militaries could bring to the table that these institutions don't already have? Predominantly for the, sort of that first sort of band aid, the first sort of 72 hours, it's knowing what effect you need to have. You'll get notice of the hurricane coming in and they're usually trapped from the, the coast of Africa as they come across. So you get a good idea of, of, of where they're going to make landfall so you can position the ship uh, and literally follow the hurricane in. And then once it's gone through, uh, you'll have the aircraft on board so they can go up and do the initial sort of reconnaissance and, and, and reach out to the, the, the key players ashore. I'm heading to the University of Bath to speak with Sophia hatzis Savadu. She's an expert on the environment and can tell me more. Climate has always been changing. However, what has happened more recently is that human activities and more specifically the extraction and burning of fossil fuels has significantly disrupted the natural carbon uh, cycle. And um, although we know that there have been previous uh, extinction uh, events, for example, recent changes are specifically due to human activities. And this is what, why we call climate change today anthropogenic. At the heart of disaster response operations are the humanitarian principles. These principles help guide the decision making for organisations providing relief. To find out more, I'm here at REACT HQ to speak to operations manager Paul Taylor. He knows what it's like to be on the ground. Let's see what he's got to say. 70% of our volunteer base are military veterans and the rest are blue light responders and some civilians. We state that we use a military approach to disasters. Um, so, you know, if you look to set a set of our operations orders, it will be very familiar with what people have done in the military, same headings. We use the seven questions estimate with a humanitarian slant on it um, and lots of our standing operating procedures people would potentially recognise from the military. And the main thing is that bit about the command philosophy and mission command, which really allows us to do what we do, I think. That's what unlocks the whole piece. And from my perspective as a veteran, and I think I speak for most of them, 
whilst we are disaster responders, it's undeniable that a byproduct of what we do is people gain a sense of purpose. I know that when I deploy into a disaster zone, in the back of my mind, on the back burner, sometimes it is challenging, sometimes it is very dangerous being in an earthquake, it's quite frightening, but they're natural events. Nobody is actively trying to kill me like they were doing when I was a serving soldier. Now hearing about the humanitarian principles, I can begin to think of some of the issues associated with military involvement. Of course, militaries carry out tasks to do with the interests of whichever country it is that they serve, naturally causing some complications. Some think the military only provide aid to foreign countries because of deeper interests or hidden agendas, more politically driven than simply addressing the needs of those affected. So, it isn't always something positive. Well, there's a constant sort of stream of crises, really. But one of the biggest ones when I started was a crisis in Darfur, which was the biggest humanitarian crisis at that particular time. But all that area of Northeast Africa, uh, Chad, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Somalia, there were constant crises of conflicts, but also natural disasters, and sometimes natural disasters and conflicts. Of course, Afghanistan was, was a constant drumbeat of, of uh, problems with conflict and, uh, and climate problems as well. Um, and then there were particular disasters which struck, like the earthquake, the earthquake in Haiti in the beginning of 2010, uh, the big cyclone in Myanmar in 2009, which killed 150,000 people. You know, so there was always these climatic, so-called natural disasters. The, the, the experts don't like the term because they're usually man-made in one way or another, actually, but so-called natural disasters. They're man-made in the sense that, of course, there's a natural phenomenon, which is an earthquake uh, or a, a cyclone or a flood or you know, a, a volcano exploding, whatever it might be. But the, the fact that that causes deaths and destruction is because often um, things have not been built properly, the protection's not been put in there, people shouldn't be living in that area because it's prone to flooding. So, you know, the, the reason it's a disaster is because of the way man has dealt with that area uh, rather than the, the actual natural phenomenon. So that's why they tend to avoid uh, the, the word natural disasters. Why is it that we don't see more of a military presence during disaster situations? Well, there are certain criteria that need to be met before the military is sent in to help. When the crisis comes, you want to find aid wherever you can find it. <laughs> so um, you don't ask too many questions perhaps where, where the assistance comes from. Um, but most aid actually is channeled either through UN agencies or the International Red Cross and Red Crescent or uh, non-governmental organisations, international NGOs, who specialise in this kind of thing, the Oxfam, Save the Children, the International Rescue Committee, I mean, there are quite a number of these uh, organisations. So that's the channels, and go the governments give money to those organisations to go and give that assistance. And that's better in a sense, because A, they're specialised at it, they understand it, that's what they do all the time. You have specialised um, people and, and uh, systems which can, can respond very quickly. But also it makes it less political. Uh, because it's not so obvious that the people you know, um, delivering the aid have some other political agenda which people, are people on the ground might be suspicious of. What's known as the Oslo Guidelines states that foreign militaries should be used as a last resort. At home, three criteria must be met before the UK government call upon the military to support domestic civil authorities. One, military aid should always be used as the last resort. The use of mutual aid, other agencies and the private sector must be otherwise considered as insufficient or be unsuitable. Two, the civil authority lacks the required level of capability to fulfil the task and it is unreasonable or prohibitively expensive to expect it to develop one. Three, the civil authority has a capability but the need to act is urgent and it lacks readily available resources. But could this be done differently? And, if so, what problems could the military face? Is the views of the people on the ground, what do they think of this aid? Now, there's a whole separate lot of questions about how effective you need to be when you're delivering it. You've got to make sure that everybody's not delivering the same thing in the same place and nobody's delivering anything over here, for example. That's what I, my role was at the UN, to make sure that coordination worked properly to avoid gaps and overlaps. But then also you need to make sure that all these organisations are giving people what they actually need, not, you, not you're, you're not giving them what you have to give, irrespective of whether they need it or not. And actually there's a move these days to giving people money, because that means if they have money they can get what they need without you deciding whether they need soap or cooking pots 
or food or whatever it might be. And you know, bear in mind also that if you give people food or if you introduce food into a situation, you have to be careful about how you handle that because you're likely, if you're not careful, to bankrupt the local farmers because you're destroying their markets. And that, you know, when people are dying of hunger, you have to find the food and bring it in. But as soon as you can, you should start to rely on local supply, not bring it in from outside, and particularly not using your own food surpluses just to keep, uh, keep things better at home. There was nothing. The police then came. We, have, uh, we had a lot of people coming from, uh, a lot of military people, army people, but not in their uniform. They were here on the private mission because that we have no marching order. So this was their personal decision? Yes. To come? Yes. And they came here to this place and they helped, but not um, the really army. And the army, of course, they have tanks, they have machines. They could do so much. Sometimes they brought in tanks and, um, and army when a politician came to this place. When, of course, all the TVs and cameras have been built up, then um, the army came. The politician was gone away. The army went away as well. So that's not how it should be. It's undeniable that militaries offer unique and effective capabilities like highly trained personnel, an effective command structure, transport and logistics. But what about the UK armed forces specifically? There are certainly circumstances where there's, there are some things that only the military can do at short notice because they have the people and the equipment uh, you know, and maybe the, the, the sort of physical strength, as it were, uh, to bring to that situation. And a very obvious example would be a hurricane strikes a Caribbean island, there's a British naval ship in the, in the vicinity, it goes to help and it can bring food and water and provide people on the ground to sort of rescue whatever, whatever it can do. Uh, you know, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Uh, and indeed many countries, and certainly in Asia, um, the first line of defence for, for a humanitarian disaster is the armed forces of that country. They are trained to do that. They use for that purpose. China would be an example, and I think India does, does that very often too. Um, so, you know, th th there's a very obvious um, thing that they can bring to that. And in natural disasters, most of the time, you know, the fact that they are military, as it were, doesn't matter because this is not a politically charged situation. It's just a crisis. However, there are situations where natural disasters are also politically charged. And Cyclone Nargis in Myanmar in 2009 was a good example. It was a military regime, very suspicious of the outside world. And we had a, a devil's own job to persuade the government at the time, this military government, to accept any aid from outside at all. Now, the idea of them accepting military aid from the outside would have been completely out of the question. It was completely out of the question. So, you know, that's where you need to be very sensitive again that the, and the UN has an advantage because the UN has legitimacy because it's a universal organisation which Western armed forces or Western um, delivery systems perhaps don't have uh, and that was a natural advantage for the UN. But as I say, you know, if it's a natural disaster situation and the military's got something it can offer, uh, some piece of equipment, bridging, whatever it might be, which is vital, then it's welcome with open arms. Um, but it's, you know, if possible, the humanitarian aid people would always say, if we can do it without the military, we'd rather, because it, it's just less complicated. Aside from climate-related disasters, something you may have seen in the news was the UK Armed Forces' response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Operation Rescript. This was described by the MOD as the biggest ever homeland operation in peacetime, and involved around 23,000 personnel a huge part of which comprised of soldiers, sailors and members of the RAF. From tackling disinformation to supporting the NHS, UK military personnel prove their worth during a time of crisis. In a pandemic age, the UK Armed Forces will likely find themselves responding to more operations of this kind at home and abroad. I'm wondering if we'll see them restructure or update their equipment to keep up with this evolving threat. Op Rescript is hardly the first time we've seen the armed forces respond to disasters on home soil. Like the flood affected areas in Germany, the UK is also prone to flooding. In the past, military personnel have been deployed up and down the country to help protect vulnerable communities. Individuals from the RAF, Royal Navy and the Army have come together to provide food, water and establish flood defences. And as we experience heavier and more unpredictable rainfall, flood relief will become something the UK Armed Forces play an even bigger part in. 
It's also vital that militaries everywhere address their carbon emissions. When we say that the armed forces have a special role to play in uh, climate mitigation and adaptation, we don't only refer to the kind of humanitarian part they can play, we also refer to what they can do in order to uh, completely redesign the way they operate. Now this is hugely important because we know, for example, that uh, the U.S. Army is the single biggest emitter in the world. It's, it's the single organization that emits more than any other institution in the world. Uh, we also know, for example, that in the case of the U.K., um, the U.K. armed forces are, uh, account for about 50% of uh, the state's emissions. So it's, it's imperative that they start by completely redesigning their own operations from supply chains, to uh, changing the kind of vehicles they use, uh, to change the kind of uh, fuels we're using, uh, to play our own part in how we use land um, in terms of uh, sequestrating carbon dioxide, for example, and so on. So uh, the positive role that militaries can play uh, is multidimensional, really. The disasters of the future are going to require more people from lots of different organisations to respond. Perhaps we will see more collaboration between military and civilian organisations. Of course, everyone has different cultures and ways of doing things, and the military and civilian world are no different. But as the world changes, it's not a matter of whether these institutions should work together, but how best they work together to help those impacted by disaster. So, how do we get there? There probably are going to be more situations uh, where you know, natural disasters, climate-related disasters, droughts, forest fires, floods and so on, are going to happen. So it makes sense for armed forces to prepare themselves for that and what they can do in those circumstances. Um, and to train you know, for that, uh, because it's going to be more frequent. Um, and there are certain things which I say armed forces are extremely good at doing. Search and rescue can be one of them. I mean, there are specialists you know, in the fire service and others who do that too, but the, the, the armed forces can do that. Field hospitals, which can be quickly deployed, for example, hospital ships, you know, can be an incredible thing which, which almost no one else can provide uh, and maybe nece very necessary in, in those circumstances. Now, whether the, you know, in any given circumstance the military doing that will be the best response will depend on where it is and what the circumstances are. You know, very often the first consideration is can the authorities of the country where this is happening deal with it by themselves. Sometimes they can, or they insist on doing it by themselves. If you're Chinese, you know, you do it by yourself. You don't want any foreigners coming and interfering. But many countries in Africa and, and some in Asia are simply not in that position. They have to rely on foreign assistance. And I think the military can play a role in that um, you know, in the future, and probably a greater role if they're prepared and trained and ready to do that. And if they are uh, aware of the sensitivities that that can bring, Somebody else's armed forces turning up in your country, even on a humanitarian mission, can raise all sorts of difficulties and sensitivities and hackles and suspicions. Uh, you know, you need to be aware of those before you start so you can manage them uh, and not make them worse by being rather blundering and insensitive in the way you go about it. At the core of any response is humanity. That the lives of those affected by disaster are the single most important thing in all of this. Such devastation often brings people closer together and it's this sense of unity that will no doubt carry us through.